Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has a diverse collection of mums that can add beauty to empty spots in your fall garden. Kristen Baum, OSU professor of integrative biology, gives us an update on the monarch migration. We visit a special garden at the OSU Insect Adventure. Mike Miller from Pond Pro Shop in Shawnee, Oklahoma, has tips for managing algae in stock ponds and large ornamental ponds. And we see how biological controls are used in the OSU teaching greenhouses to battle the mealybugs. Often when we think about chrysanthemums or mums, we imagine these nice, perfectly rounded mounds of flowers that come in bright colors of reds, yellows, and oranges, and often pink. While we think of these because they're so nice to either put into the landscape or put into a container and tuck in a few pumpkins, this isn't the only way we can incorporate mums into our landscape. In fact, this is more of an annual mum. A lot of times we treat this, we just put it in for the one autumn season, and then we dispose of them after that season. But we have a few other mums here at the gardens that we've incorporated into the landscape. And this is a nice addition to also think about adding into your landscape. We've highlighted one before called Country Girl, which is a nice lime pink color. But here we also have one called Autumn Bronze. Now, being a low maintenance gardener, a lot of times mums need to be pinched back. So often when you buy some of those mums for the fall season, there are a few, depending on the cultivars, that are winter hardy and you can get them established in your garden landscape. Now, depending on which ones you get, some of them have been bred to sort of be self-pinching, meaning you don't have to do anything to them in the summertime in order to keep that nice round shape. However, there are some that still require that pinching in late June in order to maintain that shape. But being a low maintenance gardener, I don't really like that added necessity, uh, that added chore to do in the garden. So here we have some that we haven't pinched and you can see the nice kind of sprawling habit that they create. This particular cultivar is called Autumn Bronze, which gives you this nice kind of golden copper color in the garden. There's another cultivar that we've added called Brandywine Sunset that has a nice cheerful yellow center to it with that yellow eye and then kind of trails out to more of a pink, pale pink color on the margins of those petals. We also have one called Peaches and Cream that have a nice bashful look with the white and the pink mixed together and again that yellow button center to them. Each one of these are a nice addition to the garden landscape. They'll get to be about two and a half to three feet tall. And while they wait all season long to take center stage, a lot of times you'll find that some of the other perennials sort of overshadow them. And so what's nice is they come in and almost fill in those spaces between your perennials. Um, you might find that they don't necessarily have that habit because we haven't pinched them, but they really do well to kind of create a nice filler amongst all the other plants. And they add a new dynamic late in the season. It's almost a resurgence to your garden when just you think it's almost finished. Again, with all of these, if you wanted to create more of that clumping habit, you could do that by pinching them back in June, and that would create that clumping habit. But we like the spreading habit here. And again, it's low maintenance. Now, these plants require a moist but well-drained soil with a neutral pH or maybe slightly acidic. The nice thing about mums is that they're also deer resistant and they're a nice addition for those late season pollinators flying through.
Let's talk for a minute about one of the common things we get phone calls about, a farm pond. A lot of people have them in Oklahoma. There's probably more farm ponds than there are backyard ponds. What can we do for a pond as large as this that has as many fish in it, that gets runoff in it, has animals, maybe cattle drinking out of it coming in? What, what can you do? Well, there's really very little that you can do to make it clear like your backyard yard pond might be, but you can help it out a lot. The number one thing you can do in a pond like this is aeration. Whether you use a fountain to aerate it so you can look at it and it's pretty, or whether you're gonna put a bottom aerator in it, one that has a compressor that sits on the side near the electricity, a hose that runs down underground, goes down to the bottom of the pond and allows bubbles to come up. That column of bubbles coming up from the bottom causes it to drag water from the bottom all the way up to the surface where oxygenation can take place. Otherwise, you're out of balance. You don't have enough oxygen in your water. So that's the single most thing you can do for your pond to help keep it clean. Now, unfortunately, if you have animals in it and it's got a dirt bottom, they're gonna stir up some of that dirt and you're gonna have some problems. But if you'll start early enough and do that with the aerator and then begin to add bacteria that removes muck. We've seen studies that show you can remove as much as five to six inches of muck out of the bottom of the pond simply by adding bacteria throughout the year. It's not a quick fix. It's not something that's gonna happen overnight or next week. It's gonna be a process that you're gonna go through for the entire year and treat on a regular basis, weekly or monthly, so that you've added a huge amount of bacteria to your pond. That and aeration are the two biggest things that we can do. Now we also have all kinds of lake management products and they're called lake management because the rest of it's backyard pond stuff. So what we, what we have are herbicides that are gonna kill the plants that grow in your pond. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. When those plants die and fall into the water in the bottom, they begin to decompose. And that releases more of that nutrient in the water that causes algae to grow on. So then instead of just having brown from the dirt, you can have green from algae growing in there too. So that's, a, that's really a sticky wicket when you start adding chemicals to your pond to try and kill off vegetation. If you do too much of that and you have fish in your pond, then the dying vegetation removes oxygen from the water and that lack of oxygen is what kills your fish. So if you'll notice a lot of times when we hear about a fish kill in one of our big lakes in Oklahoma, it comes on the morning news. And the reason for that is because the plants in the water and the fish and life things in the water have been using oxygen all night. That water in the summer already holds less oxygen, so it's at its lowest level early in the morning and that vegetation, the dying vegetation has removed more oxygen. That's what's gonna have cause a fish kill. And which fish do you think are gonna die first? The little ones or the big ones? The ones that need the most oxygen or the ones that need the least oxygen? So that's, that's how a fish kill occurs. Now the other thing you can do, and this pond has done it pretty well here, the homeowner has got a lot of good grass growing along the edges. There's not a lot of dirt showing. So any runoff that comes out, and most, uh, most Oklahoma ponds are retention ponds anyway. They're intended to catch water. So the runoff that's coming in here is being filtered by the grass, and a lot of that dirt that would normally wash in is being held back by the grass and it's used to grow on. So it's good and healthy for all the way around the pond when they have one that's, that's been fixed as well as this one has. Hi there, I'm Andrina Shufran with the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology and I'm director of the Insect Adventure here in Stillwater. Today I'd like to introduce you to a new feature that we have at the Insect Adventure, the world's only entomology education garden. There's all sorts of plants and things set up 
for kids to learn how to collect insects as well as just enjoy observing them. I'm going to walk you through a few of those today, but what I want everybody to take home is this is not a fancy don't touch garden. This is a garden all about bugs. So you have to get out there and whack them. This is an insect trap that a lot of people have never seen before. It's called a malaise trap and it's used to collect flying insects during the day. They hit this panel, fly up, and you can collect them in the jar. There are lots of different kinds of traps for catching all different kinds of insects. This trap is a permanent trap and one you may have heard about before. This is a black light trap for catching flying insects at night. It's in front of the insect adventure. It's open to the public all year long and it's amazing the animals that you can find in here. Moths and butterflies, but also praying mantises. And we've got lacewing today, all sorts of animals. And this is available to anyone who makes the trip. This is an easy insect trap that you can do at home. These are called pan traps, and it's just water in brightly colored plastic bowls. And the color actually attracts different kinds of insects to the different colors. And so if you have several, you can collect all sorts of different things. But it's just water in here, so check it every day or keep it empty or you'll have a big stink pile. This is a yellow sticky trap, another insect trap for catching flying animals. Very inexpensive. You can hang them anywhere on anything. And when the animal hits the trap, they're stuck. And there's all different kinds of things. Got a bee, got a little wasp here. The thing with this trap is it needs to be changed and replaced regularly especially after wind or when it's really crowded. This is another fun trap that you can do at home. All you need is two large plastic cups that fit inside each other. This is a pitfall trap. You dig a hole in your backyard, put both cups in, take the lid off, Any insects and arthropods walking around will walk to the edge, fall in, and be stuck until the morning. And then you just take the cup back out, put the lid on, and you can take it inside to see what you've got. The best way to store this is with the lid on so you don't get another stink pot. While this raised bed isn't a trap, it's an enticement for kids as well as butterfly larvae to come in and experience the scents of plants. Thyme, lavender, rosemary, basil. In this bed, there are also some host plants for caterpillars, especially black swallowtails so that kids can see those guys up close. Now here's something you might not think of as an insect trap, but most definitely is. These are old rotten logs that we've collected from the areas around Stillwater, and they make wonderful hiding places for all the different kinds of insects that live and eat inside wood. So this is a great area for a kid who's not maybe somebody who likes to run around as much, but is more meticulous and likes to sit and pry things apart to see what's inside. This cool thing is called a burlazy funnel, and it's a way to sort out insects from the dirt and compost that they're living in. So simply what we have here is a funnel this one is actually made out of a paint can and it's got a screen inside. You put the compost or the dirt that you get from outside, set it inside on the screen, turn the light on, 
the heat drives all of the critters inside down into the cup, which has got plaster of Paris moistened in there, and the animals will survive for a couple of days so you can come back and look at them. So as you can see, there are lots of neat things to discover here at the Insect Adventure and tons of cool bugs outside waiting for you to come and discover them. The Insect Adventure is open every first and third Saturday of every month of the year from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's $3 as an entrance fee, but you can stay the whole four hours, and we ask that you please bring a mask to keep other people safe. I'm here at the Botanic Garden at OSU looking for monarch butterflies. Um, it's been an interesting year for the monarch migration, especially if you compare it to uh, the past recent years, so uh, perhaps since 2015. Um, so the migration has been late in previous years. Um, uh, warm temperatures in the upper Midwest slowed the migration, so we didn't have monarchs here well into October, um, and the migration kind of trailed out um, and lasted for quite a long time. Uh, this year was different. There were cooler temperatures um, up uh, farther north, and so the migration moved through very quickly. Uh, we have reports of monarchs both to the east, the west, and the south of Stillwater, but we haven't seen very many in Stillwater itself. So usually when we're looking for monarchs, uh, thinking about tagging and, and recording uh, information about the migrants as we look for uh, good conditions. So a lot of times we think about when we have winds coming out of the north, when those shift to coming out of the south, that will kind of stall the migration. Um, and then we'll usually have a lot of monarchs uh, drop down into the area. And it's usually good timing for uh, tagging and uh, weighing and measuring and, and looking at other aspects of the, of the monarch migration. Uh, this year, we've consistently had winds out of the north. Um, and so the monarchs moved through quickly and uh, didn't stop to nectar. So they, they moved by um, higher up. And so uh, we have Usually we're catching well over a thousand monarchs um, each year, and this year um, we're at less than 10. Uh, so I caught number nine today here at the, <laughs> at the Botanic Garden. Um, and so uh, interesting year, but hopefully a good sign for the monarch population um, in terms of them making it to Mexico earlier, um, and then more of them uh, making it through that migration um, and uh, hopefully doing well over the winter, but, but time will tell. I also wanted to provide an update about some of our mowing studies. Um, a lot of people have noticed the signs that we have um, out on 51 where we have uh, mowing plots. Um, I collaborate with uh, Dennis Martin uh, on looking at different mowing regimes and the effect on uh, milkweed plants as well as nectar plants and, and monarchs. Uh, so, and there's starting to be more research coming out in the area of mowing. Um, and so the timing of mowing will influence uh, the regrowth of the milkweed plants as well as other uh, wildflowers. And so what we find is that the monarchs prefer that uh, tender regrowth um, or new growth in some cases. Um, and so they, they do preferentially lay eggs on those, those milkweed plants. Um, in terms of other resources for monarchs, so thinking about nectar plants for the fall migration, uh, the mowing uh, affects different species differently. Uh, so in some cases you might be able to mow um, and then extend the time period in which uh, species might be blooming. So there would be other non-mode areas. Uh, so for example, in adjacent grassland that would have species that were blooming at kind of the regular time. And then with mowing, you might be able to shift that blooming period a little bit later. So extending the time period that we have good resources available for monarchs. Often we talk about outdoor garden management and how to manage those pests, 
But when you're looking at a controlled environment or a greenhouse, managing those pests can sometimes be a different challenge. A lot of times greenhouse managers might see problems like thrips, scale, and white flies and have to figure out how to resolve those problems. Well, of course, there's always pesticides, but looking at a more of an IPM approach or integrated pest management is really the best approach, where you want to look at using environmental or biological controls before you go to those pesticides. Today we're here at the Greenhouse Learning Center to talk with Holly Passmore, who is the greenhouse manager, about how she is using the mealybug destroyer in order to control those pesky mealybugs. I'm Holly Passmore. I'm the greenhouse manager for the Greenhouse Learning Center. And today we're gonna to talk about mealybugs. So some of the common insect pests in greenhouses are aphids, thrips, mealybugs, spider mites, and scale. Um, mealybugs and scale are really hard to control. So what we are doing is we're using IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management, and that is a form of using beneficial insects to help combat the insects that are detrimental to our crops. So what we're using in the greenhouse to combat the mealybugs is the mealybug destroyer, also known as cryptolamus, to combat our mealybug issue. Now all stages of the cryptolamus will feed on the mealybugs, so they're always going to have a food source until they complete their mission. The adults will eat up to 250 mealybugs in their lifetime and then they will reproduce and start another generation. So the difference between an, a mealybug and a mealybug destroyer, they look very similar. They both will have a white waxy coating on them, but the mealybugs are going to be much smaller and they're not going to be moving as readily as the mealybug destroyer. The mealybug destroyers are going to be larger than the mealybugs and they are really fast movers. So that's, that's a good way to tell the difference on what you have. When the mealybug destroyer molts into the adult, it will be basically a ladybug and it's not your typical ladybug, it's going to be much smaller than the regular ladybug. So mealybugs will feed on the saps of the plants, they will get in the creases of the plants, the underside of the leaves, and you really won't notice a problem until you see the plant starting to decline. And once the plant starts to, to decline, it, once on a closer expect, inspection, you'll see some sooty mold that they produce. So the cryptol, cryptolamus is the best insect predator for controlling a severe infestation of mealybugs because they're going to eat a lot of mealybugs. So once they are done eating and they've cleaned up the plants, they can also feed on other soft-bodied insects like aphids, some spider mites, and just some other food sources that they, they can find. So your mealybug destroyers will come in a vial like this. We release 250 of them in two greenhouses. Now, you will not be able to buy these locally. They are going to have to be specially gotten from a insectary. Now, the, the mealybug destroyers are gonna be perfect for a hobby greenhouse or in commercial settings, but they're not really used for home gardening.
There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we'll talk garden relationships, clean out the keyhole and divide the lambs, and we'll harvest sweet potatoes and peanuts, and then Barb will throw them in the pot for some stew. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.